Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to go with the second session of today, starting with Fidar talking about interactive visualization in the Jupyter Notebook. OK. Thanks. Uh, so this is I'll be talking about interactive 3D visualization in the notebooks. And this is, the authors here are all uh, situated at similar research lab in Norway. And we're part of the wider effort of the Open Dream Kit project, which is an open digital research environment project under a European research grant. And we're working on the work package that is the user interfaces, which is mainly done focusing on Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so if we're going to do 3D visualizations in the Jupyter Notebooks, which is a stated wish, we've made a little bit of a wish list of kind of the features that such a thing would have. So ideally, you would want a power, powerful set of plotting functionality, which focus on the sciences. And then you would want this platform or whatever to be extensible. And you definitely want interactivity. So you will be, won't be able to inspect it more closely, uh, uh, just and rotate it around. It's not just going to be a static figure. And it's want, you want it to be responsive. Um, you also want some inspection tools. For example, if, uh, if you have a volume, you want to be able to clip it with a clip plane, and you want to do maybe some thresholding, some ISO surfaces. You probably also want some camera control, so scripted camera control, so you can do uh, uh, more of a narrative in your presentation. And you want it to be easy to share with others, which also then requires the next point that it might also you should, it should be able to work without the notebook, both when you're generating it and maybe also when you're viewing it. That's the, that's the wish list of, of features that we were able to think of. Uh, you might have more, but at least that's the wish list probably, or maybe we won't be able to get all of them, but that's, that's the, the stated goal. Um, there we go. Um, so when we started working on this in early 2007, we did a bit of a review of the current state. So as a disclaimer, this, this figure here and what I'm talking about is not going to be exhaustive. There's always going to be new projects, either that we didn't see or we excluded for some other reason. But we did a bit of a review and tried to figure out, okay, what things currently work in notebooks for 3D visualization, Jupyter notebooks. And this is a bit of a complex figure and it's not supposed to go through this in detail. I just want to highlight that uh, there are several different packages which have several different technical solutions for how to do it. And one of the common patterns that emerge is that things like SagePlot and uh, Mayavi, for example, they generate a static HTML. They have JavaScript in it, but they generate a, an HTML snippet with JavaScript that they then send to the front end, which you can then use to interact with things, but they, there is no back and forth communication between uh, the kernel side, which is Python, and the browser, which is, 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 is in the JavaScript. And then there are some other packages that are then based on Jupyter Notebooks, and there are some that uh, 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 Jupyter widgets I'm in, and there are some who would use uh, comms directly to talk to things. There are other things as well that I'll get into as we go along, but uh, the first thing I just want to say then is Jupyter widgets. Um, I haven't really introduced Jupyter Notebooks because I assume uh, a lot of people know it or can easily find out what it is, but Jupyter widgets is a, a package that makes user interface uh, um, outputs in the notebook, but where the kernel, that is the Python side and the front end side, share some state that is JSON serialized, which means that it's, a, it's an interface or there's a, it's a framework for sending data back and forth between the, the front end and the back end. And the, the standard package includes just some basic UI things like buttons, so you can trigger an action in the kernel or just the number and text input and stuff like this. So then you can have that you click a button and you do a calculation and then you show an output to, uh, as a consequence of that. So that's figured, something we figured we would want to use uh, for uh, the, the uh, 3D widgets. There's a lot of packages that use it. And we figured that's a good practice because that allows us a lot of feature. Since the state is also JSON serialized, this is also an avenue for being able to use this uh, a, to be uh, reproducible, and B, that you can share it outside of the notebook, because once you have the state in the JSON package, you can just package it up together with your JavaScript and share this as an HTML file that you can then send to, to other authors or, or other uh, people you want to share with. 
So some of the examples of current existing packages that does this, uh, it's again, not exhaustive. It's Mayavi, IPy Volume, and PyTJS. And I just wanted to sh quickly demo some of them working in the notebook. Um, sorry, that's the wrong tab. So if you have a Jupyter Notebook here, this is the Mayavi thing. They have a specific, uh, just a test function for testing that it works. It's a nice little interesting geometry with some texture. You can, you can manipulate this with the mouse and you can zoom in and out and you can, and this is based on XGD, which is a declarative uh, XML based way of specifying your scene. And it has some key functions that are quite magical. If you know the key shortcuts, you can do some things, but it's not necessarily easy to know, but it's, you know, it, it works and it's interactive. It's what you want. You can inspect it. Another example here is IPyVolume. This has a little bit more code in its example, but I'm not going to go through exactly what it does. Here, it's a volumetric rendering based on grids. That's its main, uh, main selling point, and that you can do some things. And since this is based on widgets, you can have some sliders here, which means you can interactively define some of the properties of your plot. Uh, another example is here. There is a scatter plot. And you can then interactively change the size of your glyphs, for example, or you can select another color, say you want it to be blue, uh, and uh, uh, resize those again. So there's, this is a package that then delivers on the interactivity uh, of it. And since this is based on widgets, it should also be reproducible uh, if you save out the state. That's IPy volume. Uh, another example here is PyTreeJS. I'll come a little bit back to the next slide when I come back to exactly how this works. But this is a more of a, of a port of an existing JavaScript 3D library. So it's more gen generic 3D stuff and not necessarily just focused on plotting. So this is a more uh, generic thing. So it has a little bit more of a setup. But by uh, being based on this 3D things, uh, 3D engine, you can do some more custom stuff. So for example, here they've had plotted a surface, but you can see we have some interactivity here with the ball, and this syncs back to the Python side. So this, this uh, little widget up here tells the position, and you can double click and add another uh, point. And this round trips to the kernel so that it knows where the points you picked are. So you can have this to, to okay, I want to make this point here, and then do the calculations with this. And then, um, Say you want to save some state either of these positions, or let's say you have found a camera position that is the one you need. The camera is uh, an object here directly in the Jupyter Notebook. So if you say if you want to make this reproducible, you can just quickly print out the position and the rotation of the camera. And then you can copy paste that into your initialization code. And then the next time you run it, the camera will start there. That's just some, some kind of basic building blocks to hopefully let people do what they want later on. And if I then go back to the slides, uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time mentioning TreeJS. If you go back to this dependency graph, a lot of these things use TreeJS. TreeJS is a pretty popular and mature JavaScript library for doing 3D in the browser. This is based on WebGL, like all of the browser 3D things are. And it's a scene graph implementation, meaning that you have an object hierarchy, so that if you rotate one, its children rotates with it and all these things. Um, for those of you who have used Paraview offline, there's the Paraview web. It used to be based on this. They're, uh, they're moving on. I'll talk a little bit more about their, their suggested solution later on. Uh, but several of the current existing efforts use it. So we figured, is this maybe a way to reduce the fragmentation? And that's where the PyTreeJS that I uh, just demoed, uh, the last of the demo I showed there, comes in. Because that's then... Um, possibly a way, to, way to, to, to bind things together at that level. So after doing this review, we considered, OK, what can our contribution to this, this ecosystem be? So we figured it was two points we wanted to do with Simula. One is to create a new functionality uh, um, to enable other people to not have to do the same. Or basically, we wanted to reduce duplicate work among all these packages. So either create new utilities, uh, expand uh, current utilities, or extract utilities from packages and make them reusable across uh, the, different pack uh, the different packages. So an example of this would be to have a plotting grid 
just a back, uh, back uh, grid that the auto scales. That's something we've done, and I'll show it later on. Uh, a way to have camera controls and animation system. These things like this, so that if you are a package developer and say, I want to visualize this, I need to make a custom uh, GL shader for this to make this work, but I need, need this to do my work, then you shouldn't have to make a full package with all of the camera controls and all of the syncing, worry about how to get the data back and forth. You should just be able to uh, write the stuff that you need and then reuse uh, our infrastructure, basically. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do was, of course, then fill in the gaps of missing functionality. Oh, yeah, this is, um, I will mention this. So, um, an example of something where we added functionality and tried to base this on our newly created infrastructure is uh, volumetric rendering of unstructured meshes. So, IPyVolm, that I showed you previously, is image based. It means it's uh, laid out in a grid, the data is grid based. Uh, if you do computational fluid uh, simulations like they do in the Phoenix project, you often end up with tetrahedral meshes, or tetrahedral cells. So if you can see the wireframe here, these points do not match up to a grid. So these are examples of something uh, that we uh, did here. There's a brain. I wanted to do a live demo of this as well, but since my laptop is not very powerful, I want to do it a little more, a bit more basic. Um, Again, it's a notebook. I'm not going to go through all the points because, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain everything. Um, but we basically set up a renderer here. So this is this is basic. This is the like the, the utilities that you want you to have, to have to set up a basic rendering scene with the basic grid like this, and then you can supply just the renderer. So here we have uh, already inputted the data through this infrastructure things so that these data widgets are able to get the data to where you want it. And then all you have to do is then write the shaders code. And then the scene automatically, or the grid automatically resize to fit your, your object. And it gives nice labels on it and, 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 and these things. And then you can focus on having the, the actual object. So here is a model of a heart, a pretty simplistic model of the heart uh, with a volumetric rendering. And then you, know, you can add, with the PyTree.js objects, you can add just simple boxes. And then if I wanted to test this auto sizing, I can add another one at the larger position. You can see that the scene auto sizes to fit this so that you as a package or extension developer don't have to, to do this. Um, last point I wanted to do then is about VTK and Paraview. A lot of you have used VTK for maybe offline stuff. Uh, they have uh, they expose an interface for getting it into the browser. Uh, also based on, they used to be based on, uh, on 3JS. Now they're making their own JavaScript library. Uh, so that's an ongoing process. I don't have full control of that. So that's something we'll definitely keep an eye on and hopefully be able to, to work more with in the future. But that's a very promising project. But they're, they're doing their own stuff at Kitra. Um, so to, to, to check back with our wish list, if you go through this, the first point is maybe the one that is currently the most lacking. It's the powerful set of plotting functionality, because that's the, the high-level stuff. So we figured we wanted to do most of the lower-level stuff first. But currently, packages like IPyVolume and K3D are the packages that most uh, expose this, this uh, higher-level plotting functionality. That's something we want to expand on going forward. Extensibility, I think, uh, and interactivity, I think we've done a, a, a good job and we'll continue doing the work there on the, the, the infrastructure that I mentioned to get the, especially the data uh, up and to have everything based on Jupyter widgets, which is already a, a very extensible platform. It's very plug and play. Uh, Martin Bredel has described <laughs> it as Legos for notebooks. And inspection tools, there's a project called SciVi.js. It's based on Tree.js as well, so we're hoping to integrate that soon. And again, the easy to share with others and working outside the notebook, that should come mostly free from being where I done in Jupyter widgets. So um, that's it. Thanks for listening. And there are some resources if you uh, want to look up some of the, the existing projects. Time for questions. 
Okay, I have a question. Um, have you considered using WebGL2 or are you waiting for 3.js to support it? So uh, uh, WebGL is the underpinning of 2.js. Also have XGDOM. So all of these different things use WebGL at the back end. So 3.js used to have like a thing where you can uh, do 3D rendering if they didn't have WebGL, but that's mostly disbanded now uh, since, uh, uh, abandoned now since uh, most browsers now have WebGL capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, using WebGL too. So you have oh, like three D textures yeah, and sorry. Uh, so that's something we definitely want to do when it comes around. Uh, I think it's better to wait for three JS to have it uh, because it's a lot of work to make that middle uh, middle infrastructure there. Um, but yeah, it has some nice features that we definitely wanted, especially. Uh, but you can work around it. It's just extra work. Other questions? Then let's speak to thank the speaker again.